Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? Let me know in the chat. Got a thumbs up from Lisa. It's a good place to start. Y'all charting new territories? <laughs> Maybe lurking in some old territories? Yes, awesome. Good to see some familiar faces and names and some new names and faces as well. Well, let's go ahead and um, kick off here. So welcome to the Ohio Statewide Family Engagement Leadership Summit. Towards the end of our day here, we're glad you could join us for the last session of the day, which I know will allow you to chart some new territories and family engagement, um, even maybe further than you've been the rest of the day. My name is Meredith Wellman, and I will be this session's moderator. Um, this session is called Partnering with Families Through Community Learning Centers. If you have any summit questions, concerns, or technical issues today, um, please message me privately in the chat. Um, just so you guys know, I'm particularly looking forward to this session. I requested to be the moderator because back in the day, I worked in the Chicago Public Schools Community Schools Initiative and even did a study on the community school model while I was in graduate school. So some housekeeping, I ask that you turn off your camera and microphone during the presentation. Um, and if you have any questions for the presenter, you can use the chat feature and we can either answer those in real time or during the um, lengthy discussion planned for the end of the session. You can also join the conversation on Twitter and be sure to use our hashtag chart new territories to share your thoughts. And now, without further ado, I will turn the mic over to Quasi Rollins to begin the introductions for him and his co-presenters. So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good afternoon. We hope to make this, this last session of your experience a really good session uh, and a good experience. I'm Quasi Rollins, Vice President for Leadership and Engagement at the Institute for Educational Leadership. Uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, my other two co-presenters, Lisa Hunt from Cleveland Heights University Heights and Stuart McGuire McIntyre from Ohio Federation of Teachers, will introduce themselves in a little bit more when we get to their segments. I think we can go to, um, to the poll question. We just wanted to just, we don't have time to go through all of it, um, but we wanted to get you in the chat to, to respond to these questions, and we will pick them up throughout the course of our time together. I'm also going to uh, put them in the chat because we're not going to stay on this slide terribly long. Our uh, workshop session today is partnering with families through community learning centers. All of you are in Ohio, so you know that the community learning centers is what other folks around the country refer to as community schools. And so we're really going to kind of look at the intersection between family engagement uh, good family engagement, which is one of the pillars of a good community school, or in this case, community learning center strategy, uh, and what uh, community learners, learning centers are accomplishing and can accomplish. I'm going to give a little bit of a kind of national overview by looking at both the dual capacity building framework and some other key elements, the four pillars of a community learning center. Uh, and then Lisa will talk a little bit about this issue from the viewpoint of, of the school district. Uh, and, and Stuart will discuss this from the standpoint, from a variety of standpoints, but, but certainly as one from an educator standpoint in his role as, as uh, a leader of the Ohio Federation of Teachers. So we wanna get some sense of what are some of the major challenges. I think we can guess, we know that all over the country, folks are just struggling to open uh, open well, <laughs> and that's been a challenge to find school bus drivers to cover classrooms, to do a range of things uh, that get you to the point where you can actually um, uh, do teaching and learning in the classroom. So folks are kind of struggling uh, all over the country to get some stability. So my guess is that's also one of the challenges uh, in your context. But we also want to know what some of your challenges are uh, you're facing in launching community learning centers. And lastly, what do you hope to hear today uh, that will help you on your journey? I think we can go to the next slide. And if you, if you didn't catch the questions, look in the chat for uh, the questions. I, I put them in there. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the dual capacity building framework. You know, um, there are a lot of frameworks. Uh, this is one that we use a lot to work with people. You know, like any framework, it's, it's really helping you understand um, how to think about the issue, how to organize yourselves, what are some essential things that you need to know and be able to do to kind of get the results you want. And if we can go right to that next one in terms of capacity outcomes. So we know what the challenges are. Uh, the challenges were the challenges even before the pandemic. Um, everyone knows it's a good idea to engage families, but not everyone necessarily knows how to do it well. Uh, districts struggle with how to organize themselves to do it well. Uh, principals struggle with how to uh, foster good relationships and to support their staff in getting it done well. And so yet we want the outcome. So everyone wants good outcomes of a thing, but we are not necessarily on the same page about how to get there. So the end goal is to have effective partnerships that support student and school achievement. And we know in order to do that, we've got to empower educators uh, and we've got to empower and engage families uh, and not just uh, families in the sense of them responding to our queries and coming to a meeting that we call, but really as co-creators, as supporters, families play a range of roles as monitors, as advocates, as role models, as encouragers, and then of course, educators play the roles that they play. Uh, let's go to the, to the next slide. And this one has some, some animations, but we'll, we'll wait. So when we think about the challenge, we know that addressing the challenge requires um, that we kind of create a context in which we have essential conditions. Process conditions, which really are more focused at the individual school level, uh, and organizational conditions, which are a little bit more focused at the at the district or system wide level. Some things that have to exist. So we know process conditions. We need to have relational trust. We're coming out of a period, and frankly, a lot of districts have not done a great job even this school year, where a lot of trust has been broken, and a lot of that is because systems haven't responded well. Uh, parents find out that they don't have a bus two days before school opens. That doesn't do a lot to build relationships and trust. And yet that's the goal. So we, we need the process conditions, relational trust, activities that are linked to learning, activities that are asset-based, culturally responsive, collaborative, interactive. And you can go to, you can hit, uh, hit the button to go to the next one. Something's going to pop up. And then, of course, organizational conditions. And those are the district-wide conditions. And Lisa's going to touch on that. We need to have a system. We need to have structures. We need to, it's not enough to have a value to believe that it's a good idea to engage families, but our budgets, our structures, our practice, our capacity building, all of those things have to reflect that value. And that is what often is missing in school districts and communities, the organizational conditions. You can hit uh, the next slide. So again, and hit it again. So again, going back to process conditions, probably the most important one is relational, is trust. And the elements of relational trust are respect, competence, integrity, personal regard. Uh, and these are things that we all have to work on individually. And then depending on our role and our platforms and our entry point, and you can go to the next slide, we also have to encourage and support our colleagues, uh, our teams uh, to reflect that. I've talked enough about organizational conditions, so go to the next slide. So we, we did a piece and I'll, I'll put the, the link to that in the chat. So the organizational conditions are really, that's the systemic piece. Um, and when it comes to family and community engagement, we know that leadership drives everything. So we wrote a piece uh, that went a little bit deeper on what it means to have organizational conditions. And you can go to the next slide. And so these are, key elements of systemic engagement. And I won't read all of them, but obviously we, if you're gonna have integration, then you've gotta have policies and plans. You gotta have systems. You've gotta have a connection to the district's overarching goal. You gotta have more than just a statement in your, in your strategic plan. You've gotta actually have systems and structures and alignment. 
and a set of engagement practices that are integrated across all of your departments. Uh, and that is kind of similar to what has to happen in the community learning center. You can go to the next slide. And so at the national level, folks are struggling with how, how to do that best. I think most of you are somewhat clear on what a community learning center is. In Ohio, it's a public school. It's the idea is for it to serve as a hub. It's a place where all of the various partners uh, and assets in the community to be or can be organized. Where families and educated partner, where families are respected and engaged, where students have a voice. Uh, it is not Shangri-La. It is possible. <laughs> it's not an unachievable goal. Uh, it's very possible, and there's a number of exemplars in your state. Cincinnati comes to mind, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about other exemplars. But essentially, it is, you know, we talked about frameworks and how we are organized for success. And schools were never designed to address all of the various issues and challenges and struggles in a community, and yet all of those things show up at the school's doors. And so... The whole idea of the Community Learning Center, as you go to the next slide, uh, is to really um, have deep partnerships, uh, be connected, have a strategy that makes sense. Uh, and there's another book, uh, the uh, policy playbook for community schools that really describe the Community Learning Center in this case uh, as having four key pillars. And so any good Community Learning Center initiative they may not use this exact language uh, because people describe their work in different ways, but they should have these key elements, these four pillars. Obviously, before and after school, expanded learning time and opportunities, active family and community engagement, uh, deep collaborative practice uh, and collaborative leadership. Uh, and in, in the case where there's multiple schools uh, within an initiative, there should be some kind of a collaborative table where all of the key agencies that are involved in the services and supports and et cetera to make this work are regularly convening and comparing notes and monitoring progress. And then obviously integrated student support. Some folks refer to those as wraparound services. Um, however you name them, uh, you want, it's, you know, a community school, a community learning center is more than just uh, case management of individual student needs. It's really a system, and then we can go to the last slide for me before I turn it over to Lisa. Next slide. Uh, how we ensure equity. So equity and implementation is really about equitable allocation of resources. A lot of money has come down to your, to your district from the state to support this strategy. And so making sure that we have adequate, my alarm just went off, so that means I'm almost out of time. Um, equitable allocation of resources is key. Um, uh, you know, in many respects, more money is never something that folks will turn down, but in, in most of our contexts and districts, it's about the decisions we make and the ways in which we spend the money we have uh, that makes the difference. And so equitable allocation of resources based on real need, not just uh, things we think, uh, access and opportunity for all students. So we've got to be sure to take care of our English language learners, our immigrant and refugee students, our disabled students. Equitable decision-making where families are actually at the table, not in a token kind of way, but where they actually have voice and agency and ability to weigh in on the strategies that are designed to support them. And then obviously we need that. We need data all the time, and we don't need data next year. We need data today <laughs> so that we can make decisions today. It doesn't serve us well to get the, to get the data six months from now. We need it now. So that was the quick and dirty. Um, I hope you found it useful. I'll put some links in the, to those publications in the chat. And I now have you know, my great pleasure to turn it over to Lisa Hunt, who's going to introduce herself and talk a little bit about that work in Cleveland Heights and University Heights. Thanks. Thank you so much, Quazy. I'm going to set my timer. I like what you did there um, because this topic is something I could talk about all day. Um, and I'm looking forward to us having an engaging conversation with everybody in the room um, so we can answer some of those questions anytime I come to 
a training. I'm looking for those golden nuggets. And so uh, happy end of summit. I hope you guys had an amazing day. I want to thank the Ohio statewide for doing this. Um, it really is that we are stronger together. So when we can share strategies um, and really learn what is working um, based on actual application of those tools, I think we really are better for it. Um, so as Quazy and Meredith mentioned, my name is Lisa Hunt, and I'm the Family Engagement Specialist for the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District. Uh, we call ourselves Tiger Nation. Uh, so I'm, thank you so much for letting me just tell you a little bit about um, our story and our work um, in our school district. Next slide. So, you know, what, what I want to cover in the little bit of time that I have is just a little bit about our district. So I want you to meet our schools. Um, and I want to also talk about how our work is driven by our strategic plan um, and how we have family and community engagement as a strategic priority. Um, and what we're doing around partnerships. Um, I'd also like to tell you a little bit about how we're approaching family engagement and a lot of my work and the things and messaging um, that I do to support all stakeholders in the uh, district and community. And we'll talk about our launch for our community learning center, which I'm super excited about because that work is really just starting. And just specifically about the conditions um, and why we chose one particular school, which is Noble Elementary School. Next slide. So this is um, a picture of our uh, homecoming. And what it always does is brings all of our district together. It's one of those one um, opportunities to have early learners, high schoolers all come together, board members, everyone from the community coming together. Um, and I think that's kind of the theme of the community learning center and family engagement. It's people coming together. Um, in our district, we have two, 10 schools, um, two middle schools, seven elementary schools, three early learning centers, and an optional learning center also. Um, we serve three different municipalities, uh, three distinctly different and diverse municipalities, Cleveland Heights, University Heights, and South Euclid. We have about 4,800 students, I think a little bit more than that. Um, and what I would say about our district is I'm really proud of our district uh, because like many of your districts, we're looking at um, leadership and how leadership continues to need to grow and drive this work. Um, and so I have a wonderful superintendent and assistant superintendent and leaders who believe in family engagement. So I do have the opportunity to do some interdepartmental collaboration. And uh, we're always making sure that we're building that capacity and understanding. Um, and that that information then supports the leadership teams uh, in our building. So I believe that we're in a really good position when you think in terms of leadership drives change um, and how important it is. So those connectivity, uh, that connectivity, um, I think is, is it really does make a difference in our work. Um, and we also really are intentional about collaboration. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like, not just internally, um, but also internally, because we activated, I wanna say in about 2016, um, an initiative, um, citizen-led task forces. And so it's a place where families can participate, sit at the leadership table, learn, um, uh, lean into the challenges that we face and all sort of develop uh, a think tank solution um, that is really built on learning and devising solutions that are collaborative um, and then better embrace, right? We also have a number of parent groups. Um, we believe in the power of parents. And so aside from our traditional PTAs, we also have uh, KinderNet. We also have the Exceptional Children's Advocacy Group, which is a special needs parent group. And we believe in the strength of our community partnerships. Um, and I think all of these things come together, um, not in a finite place, but in process, right? So it's always about uh, being recursive and how do you continue to um, breathe life into those entities and continue to grow and learn. Next slide. So I mentioned um, one of the strategic priorities is family engagement. Um, and this is our second strategic plan. We just are just finalizing the last um, pieces on our strategic planning refresher. And what I'd like to say is family engagement was a key goal in our strategic plan. Um, family and community partners are welcomed and engaged. Um, that's specifically how we word it. And now we're looking at key indicators. What does it mean to measure family engagement? 
Um, how are we doing in those goals? Um, and you've been pushed to have key performance indicators across all five goals. I also like to say that um, goal two is our educational approach, which is all centered on equity. Um, it is not just about um, equity for equity's sake, right? Just saying it, but really looking across our district and making sure that we are um, intentional about closing achievement gaps and having um, real conversations with um, one another in regard to what are the uh, key components of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, and I'm you know, fortunate to be a part of our equity task force, but we do a lot of training um, around continuing to sort of lower racial anxiety and begin to have those critical conversations because the policy that we have in our district, it's an educational equity policy, um, and it also drives our work, is really uh, focused on the historically persistent achievement gap. So we are intentional about our language, um, and we want to keep pushing um, where we know we need to. Um, it's not always comfortable, and it's not always easy, but we know that it has to be done. So educational equity and engagement, for me, has kind of always been the two sides of one coin. Um, when we look at our population, we have 78%, um, maybe higher in some, some buildings, African-American students. And just like many of our nation's public schools, um, our staff is predominantly white. And we know that it is not often easy or natural to come outside of our, our comfort zones to talk to people who don't think like us or look like us. Um, but we are expected to do it in public schools. And so how do we do that? And so really it is just about building those trusting relationships, um, welcoming and respecting people. Those tenants that Kwesi mentioned are really a part of looking at equity as another part of engagement um, and seeing each other for their um, full selves and bringing their full identity to um, the support that they provide for their students and being welcomed into that process. Um, and so that goes into also our coordinated partnerships. I feel like I'm talking a mile a minute, guys. Um, our coordinated partnerships, which um, in our district, we have had some longstanding partners with nonprofit organizations, universities, um, even faith-based organizations and um, uh, health organizations like Metro Health and Cleveland Clinic um, have been longstanding partners. So we are activating those partnerships and that we want to see outcomes. And so in this um, iteration of our strategic plan, we're, we're calling it Together We Rise, um, we are really looking at a, looking across our goals and making sure that we're looking at outcomes now more so than any other time. Uh, next slide. So we chose Noble Elementary was recommended by a community and school supervisor after looking at um, what, again, what uh, Dr. Mapp calls the essential conditions, right? We looked at all of our schools and all of them have a lot of these same elements, but Noble was, was very uh, unique in where it sits in our community. It sits at this wonderful intersection of, um, you know, city resources and um, a beautiful uh, blooming community of refugee uh, families. It also has this wonderful longstanding community uh, group that is all about, you know, connecting with our schools and connecting residents. Um, and we also looked at um, what are the opportunities that were existing at Noble? Noble, uh, thank goodness for our universal pre-K programs and our early childhood centers, was already using the National Network of Partnership Schools. And so the thinking was, how do we scale it up? Um, and the principal raised his hand and said, absolutely, I would love to do it. And because that leader is one of those leaders that says yes um, and is very intentional about, okay, if we're integrating it, what does that look like? And so I made sure that it wasn't um, going to be viewed as something that was additional, but integral um, and part of aligning what was already there. And so what we did was we took um, the National Network of Partnership Schools uh, blueprint for four goals and made Community Learning Center and that launched our fourth goal. Um, and so we kind of looked at it as its own piece, but what it does is it allows that action team to expand, bring more people into the work. Um, and we can still be intentional about uh, implementing the framework with fidelity. Um, and so right now we are looking at our newly hired community learning center organizer um, launching uh, the needs assessment, which is all about inviting families, inviting community partners, inviting the voices of those around the school to be a part of designing this uh, for the school. So the needs assessment has to be for the people and by the people. And we're holding, uh -uh, holding her to task on that and we're supporting her in that. Um, and so she'll also be helping to co-chair 
uh, uh, and, and lead the committee. Um, so for us, it's about integration and alignment and finding ways that family engagement is embedded, family and community engagement is, is embedded um, and systemic across, across the, embedded and implemented across the system. I tried to say it too fast. All right, Stuart, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You've got your 10 minutes and I hope you set your timer. And that's just a great picture of our new community learning center coordinator and our supervisor of uh, school community partnerships, one of our parents. This is an example. I'm sorry, Stuart, don't hit me. Uh, <laughs> um, a perfect example of even during COVID, the power of partnerships allowed us to have an in-person event. And what we made sure that we did is we linked it to learning. Uh, we made sure it was safe, but we invited partners to design the event. Um, and so I think that always helps with engagement. So it's also written up as a national network of partnership schools, promising practice. Um, but I think the key component of that was that we all worked together to design something that was safe, meaningful and edifying um, and connected to learning. So thank you for your time. I hope I didn't talk too fast. Awesome, thanks Thanks so much, Lisa. And honestly, I could, I could listen to you talk all day. <laughs> um, just uh, grateful to be a part of this uh, dream team of, of presenters uh, and to be able to, to connect with all of you at this, uh, this wonderful conference, I got a chance to, to tune into the keynote earlier, um, Dr. Gorski's uh, segment on, on equity and was just, you know, clapping, clapping my hands in the, the silence of my, uh, my home office. Um, but my name is Stuart McIntyre. I work for the Ohio Federation of Teachers and I'm our Community Learning Center Project Director. Um, so today, I really wanted to, to just talk a little bit about, you know, Tracy kind of gave an overview of community schools or community learning centers as we call them in Ohio. Um, but, but I really wanted to talk a little bit about um, community learning centers in Ohio, the relationship between the family engagement work uh, and the community learning center model. Um, and if there's one thing that I want you all to, to take away from, from my section, it's really a, a curiosity about the community learning center model. Um, we really view it at, a, at the Ohio Federation of Teachers as a natural and organic extension of family engagement work. You know, if we aligned and designed a school um, with the values of, of equity-centered family engagement, a community learning center is, is what it would look like. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the, the history of this, of this work in Ohio. Um, so as, you know, for those of you that are, are familiar with this uh, uh, community learning center model, um, you've probably heard the name the Euler, Euler School in Cincinnati. Um, and this is really the kind of starting point for the uh, most recent chapter in uh, community learning center history. Um, and in 2002, Cincinnati launches its CLC model um, and uh, Akron also has a community learning center model that, that launches in 2003. Um, and so this kind of spurs you know, different levels of interest and, and you know, other districts that want to implement um, and try to recreate uh, the model in Cincinnati. Um, but in reality, there, there were some serious challenges. And one of the things that OFT really noticed uh, and what we saw from um, our members is that there really wasn't an entity out there to help provide consistent guiding support for districts that wanted to implement this community learning center model. Uh, so, so we came together with other education associations like the uh, Buckeye Association of School Administrators, the Ohio School Board Association, and others to launch the Ohio Community Learning Center Collaborative in, in 2020. Um, and, you know, really what, what I try to do um, and what, what we try to do is to support districts um, who are exploring and implementing this and to build the statewide um, consciousness and infrastructure uh, to support the continued growth. We'd love to see every single school in the state um, a community learning center. Uh, and, uh, and with that, we can actually go to the next slide. So I just wanna, you know, not to, to reiterate what, what Quasi has already kind of laid out, but just to talk about um, what makes a community learning center and the relationship uh, between the model and, and family engagement. Um, so Crazy talked about these four pillars of integrated student supports, expanded learning opportunities, 
family community engagement and collaborative leadership. Um, and the way that we understand these is through a tree. And if you think of the integrated student supports and the expanded learning opportunities as the branches and the leaves of the tree, that's what you see in a school building. You know, at, at Noble, you'll see the partnerships that they've built um, with, the, with the public library that's next door. Um, you know, in many other districts, you'll see the internship programs and, you know, summer school, after school, you know, before school learning opportunities. Um, and so that's what's kind of visible on the, on the surface in the community learning center. But what's underneath the surface and what really anchors it all is family and community engagement and collaborative leadership. And those are the roots, the roots of the model. And so, you know, to, I just literally copied and pasted uh, what, what Quasi had on one of his slides. You know, what, what we're talking about is a, a school where the wisdom and assets of the community are respected and welcomed, where students, families, neighbors, community partners work with school staff and, uh, and shape the school's priorities. You know, for a community learning center to be effective, family and community engagement have to be the roots of that tree. Uh, and so if that's work that you're already engaged in, that's a step on the path uh, towards the, the community learning center model. And we can uh, go to the next slide. Um, and, and one other piece, you know, around the country, community schools take many different shapes. Um, but for us, we, we really believe in the best practice of a uh, dedicated community learning center coordinator in each building. Um, this is incredibly important for building and maintaining relationships with partners, continuously engaging students, parents and staff. Uh, and in addition to that, it's, it's crucial to have, you know, whether it's the, the BLT and the building leadership team uh, or other bodies that already exist, a council where all of the different members of the school community are represented and have uh, decision-making power to help shape the partnerships and how a community learning center manifests in the in the school building, um, and uh, and with that we can go to the to the next slide. Um, so one place where this is really all intersected for us, and and in some ways the inception of this session is is Noble Elementary, um, where the deep family engagement work um, with the National Network for Partnership Schools model really kind of led, you know, in addition to other factors that that Lisa mentioned to Noble deciding to become a community learning center as well. Um, and just over the summer, um, they hired their community learning center coordinator, um, who is now in the process of you know, working with the, the school team to develop a, a community needs assessment. Um, and in this process, you know, they, they hope to, you know, to talk to every single family and every single member of the school community to gather input assess the assets and the needs um, before deciding, all right, here's the, here's the partnerships um, that we want to build. Here are the you know, integrated student supports and expansion and in, in learning opportunities. Um, and with that, we can go to the next slide. So uh, you, you might be thinking, okay, this, this all sounds good, um, but why, why this moment? Why, why now? Uh, next slide. So as you all know, um, especially in the midst of the pandemic, the needs of the students and families that we serve are growing. Um, this is just a collection of news articles. Um, and I'm sure that this stuff is, is not news to any of you. But something that I actually saw a couple of weeks ago um, when the data on chronic absenteeism was released in Ohio um, was, was really honestly shocking. Um, in the large urban districts in the state, the chronic absenteeism rate nearly doubled to the point where more than half of kids, 63% of kids are chronically absent in Ohio's uh, major urban districts. And across the board, we see discrepancies, as you would guess, amongst historically underserved communities, Black students, Latinx students, students with disabilities. Um, students that are economically disadvantaged. And so while we know that economic and racial inequality is already bad, it's accelerated and is getting even worse uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Meanwhile, 
the billionaires in this country who refuse to pay taxes are uh, competing to fly to outer space. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, however, there's also, in addition to this clear and urgent need, um, really a once in a generation influx of, of federal funding uh, that can support uh, community learning centers, family engagement, and a whole host of other interventions. Um, you know, school districts across the state are deciding what to do with the ESSER, the latest round of ESSER funds. And starting a community learning center is very much an allowable use of those funds. Um, this is something that um, one of the districts that we're supporting in Northeast Ohio and Ashtabula County, um, Grand Valley has decided to do. Uh, they decided to you know, use those one-time funds as a part of a long-term commitment um, to this new model and approach to, to school. Um, and next slide. So to, to just conclude, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, if there's one thing that I want you to take away, it's a level of curiosity about exploring this community learning center model, uh, determining whether it might be something that is a good fit for your school district, your community. Um, and that's something that, uh, that I can help you with and we can help you with um, at both the Ohio Federation of Teachers and the Ohio Community Learning Center Collaborative. Um, we offer stakeholder engagement and education um, to really continue to dig into, you know, what does this really mean? How do we define this? How is it uh, similar and different from, from what we're already doing, uh, as well as consultation and technical assistance, um, support in the planning process, uh, but also in the first year of implementation, um, coaching and um, support for community learning center coordinators. Um, and also, you know, thinking through these questions of how to make this sustainable, um, how to put, you know, school board policies in place that define this so that it's not dependent on the leadership of the moment, but can last for, um, for decades to come. Um, and identifying, you know, federal grants and, and funding to, to continue to bring resources into the district to support this, this work. So if you're interested in this, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and drop my email in the chat here. And uh, I'll also drop uh, our, our website um, as we continue to talk where you can, where you can learn more. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, really grateful to be able to engage and, and I'm really you know, excited for the question and answer section because you know, the dialogue is really where we, where we get to, to learn from each other and, and get into it. So folks, this is that moment where you can ask questions, reflect, uh, offer comments. This is actually a small enough group, uh, Meredith, where we might, we might actually take the slides down, see everybody, and I don't know what your protocol is, so you can, I'll let you decide what's the best way, but you can also put some questions uh, in the chat. Uh, we have um, a couple of questions there, one that was directed uh, at you, uh, Lisa, but there were two questions that I thought I would try to tackle and because I think they, they speak to the overall, you know, what are uh, two, two questions in the, what are the major challenges is, uh, you know, how do you get parents to participate in family engagement? Uh, and how do you get parents to participate where there has been no strategic initiative? So those, those of course, are, are related for me. And I take a stab at that. And I think, you know, part of it is, if you remember in the slide that we shared earlier about uh, relational trust as being one of the essential conditions on the process side. Uh, you know, it's hard to get parents to participate if you don't actually have a relationship with them. And so that's at the school, individual school level, and that's certainly at the district level. And a lot of times, and, and, and I'm not gonna make any assumptions about this group, but at least in terms of historically bad practice, we, you know, we're, we, uh, we create a, a session that's convenient for teachers. We schedule it at a time that's inconvenient for families to participate. We send out a flyer or, you know, now we're a little bit more sophisticated than flyers. We reach out to them 
um, and then we don't get a response uh, or they don't come or, or whatever. So we've got to, so part of what I'd love to understand about that question is, is, is I don't want to make assumptions about that and then I'll turn it over to Lisa, but I think that parents and families and caring adults participate when you have a relationship with them. And when you take the extra steps to create a working relationship and all of the strategies that are highly successful in terms of school-wide and district-wide family engagement have at their foundation building a relationship, building some trust. And then with a foundation of trust, being able to kind of ramp up the intensity of involvement of parents and families. So Lisa, how would you answer that question? Stuart? Thanks, Quazy. I love what you said about the relationships and that's true. And I would go a little bit further even to say that co-creation piece is important. I'm more apt to want to come to something if I've designed it. Um, if it's been, you know, something that I've thought about. Um, I, I would say too, so that's one piece of it, right? Yes, relationship, but also that co-creation, there's a reason that's so important and really is a part of family engagement. The other piece is value. Um, I think sometimes we think I had this event and families didn't come and oh darn, you know, we didn't have enough because we're still counting butts and seats. But I would say value. So if you're having a night and it's maybe literacy night and the hope was that families were able to get tools um, and tips that they could support their scholar and learning uh, or reading at home together, still push out that value. Because at the end of the day, it's not just that they did or did not come. It's that we want to empower and educate our families. I think sometimes we get a little disappointed because we have so much skin in the design game that we forget the whole thing is to really educate and empower parents. So now COVID says use technology, right? So what are those ways that even if you don't come to the event, that that event has legs, a short recording, um, something that even if I don't come while I'm cooking or driving, I can listen and learn. So we just got to remember the whole purpose of that um, is to build uh, the support for students. So I think that that sometimes happens too. For sure. Anything you'd add to that, Stuart? I think you all. I think you all covered it. There's a uh, a question right here in the chat from Tricia. Hold on, just trying to locate it. I'd love to hear some more advice and guidance regarding conducting a family engagement needs assessment in my district. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So number one, um, I'll say there are resources um, that I'm happy to send you, Tricia. If you uh, just reach out offline, we can we can connect. Um, but, but one thing that I think is just really important to hit on um, is the fact that the process of how you go about the needs assessment is just as important as the product and engaging the entire school community, um, building teams to make sure that you're not missing any of the key constituencies. Um, the process is, is, more, is more important than the product itself. Um, you know, for example, you could talk to 90% of the families in your district. You could, you know, collect data from them, right? But the students and the families that you're missing are probably the ones that need the most support. It's probably, you know, students with disabilities, homeless students and families, right? It's going to be, you know, if you, if you stop at the PTO, PTA members, if you stop at, you know, the people that are already going to raise their hand and say, okay, here's what we need. And who, you know, are used to and comfortable advocating um, for, their, for their children, you're going to miss the entire picture. Um, and so I think part of it is having that commitment and resources to actually reach everyone, you know, having those conversations about, okay, email is only going to reach a subset of our community. It's going to reach people that have professional jobs and have to use email for work, right? You might need to be, you know, using WhatsApp and texting apps and, you know, figuring out what, what are we going to do to actually get through to everyone. Um, and show in the process that we want to build a relationship we actually want to restore the trust that's been uh, that's been broken over over time and one of the one of the publications that i put in the chat taking it to the next level uh is is a set of case studies the that uh resulted from also a very intense needs assessment that we've done in several districts and 
So I, I would suggest you, you look at that publication. And then if you're interested in going further, um, you can reach out to us at IEL as well, because we that is one of the things that we do for districts around the country um, uh, is, is actually come come in. It depends on you know what your level of need is and, you know, and what you're willing to partner around. But uh, in-depth needs assessment at various aspects, uh, including a report, engaging your senior team, your superintendent, the whole shebang. So it depends on the level you're ready for. There are levels to all of this. Any other questions? Casey, can you share um, what national resources um, you encourage people to tap into for like ongoing professional learning for um, the community schools model? Maybe talk about what uh, IEL does. You know, all of the all of the things that I included a few minutes ago, you have the websites um, for both IEL, you know, the Coalition for Community Schools is a, is a project of IEL, but it has its own website. And so there's lots of tools and resources there. I also included in the publications, uh, the Learning Policy Institute, uh, which was commissioned to create the community school playbook by the Partnership for the Future of Learning. So you can go in depth into the, into the four pillars and get a clear understanding of that. Uh, and that gives you a sense of what it, what it could look like. And you can create a professional learning community around that. You can create study groups, et cetera, depending on your level. Uh, you follow us on Twitter. If you're, if, for those of you on social media, we keep very current. Both IEL, I, I put our community schools Twitter. One I forgot is our family engagement one uh, at FCE Network. I put my own up there, Quasi Baby 58. Very hard to forget um, on Twitter as well. Um, uh, in the community schools at, at Com Schools. Uh, so that gives you a lot of up to date information. Uh, we're planning for our national conference again, which is another resource. Um, we do regional learning labs and other kinds of things for learning, uh, both on the community school side and the family engagement side. So there, there are lots of resources. So I encourage you to, to go to those websites and, and um, put yourself on publication and lists so that you can get, uh, be in touch with us. Other questions, there was a question, there was a specific question to you, to you, Lisa, in the chat earlier about how Cleveland Heights, University Heights is using CLCs alongside other district initiatives and how you make connections between the, that initiative and, and staff at the various schools. It's a great question. Well, it's a beautiful question. And it, and it is my daily struggle. Um, but I think what I try to do is, again, build that value. It's sort of why are we doing this? Um, so, for example, we've been in conversations with all of our uh, principals over the last couple of days talking about these um, ESSER funds and the opportunity that it presents. And so what I always say is most of the initiatives that we launch have a family-facing component, whether it's PBIS or any academic and curricular piece. Um, there's a part that families play. Some of it is easier to parse out. Some of it is... Um, you know, prescriptive, whether it's a website or a parent portal, design those um, to be packaged and shared. And so I'm always just saying it's about embedding it into the system already. Um, and I think by not thinking about families and how they're going to support it, we do a disservice. And so that's, that's my conversation. Um, I always say too, that the element of change is at home. There's so much, um, around the conversation around how much time students are spending at school, um, but a great deal of it is at home and in the community. So how are we reinforcing those lessons? How, how is that being uh, reinforced at home? So I think what for me, it's whatever thing that we do, it is not a, oh my gosh, what about families? It's this is what we do and this is how families help. So we're going into it already thinking about that family facing component. Um, and I, I love what Stuart talked about in the dire um, place that we find ourselves in, it really is about relationships. But now more than ever, people don't have a lot of space for um, a lot of bandwidth or noise. It's got to be essential. It's got to be important. It's got to be valuable. And it's got to be targeted. I'm more apt to come and participate if I know it's going to help my scholar or child succeed. Some of the stuff, you know, when you think in terms of relationship building, that's key. But it's also put fun, put functional with that fun. Um, and so make sure that it's purposeful um, is what I would say. 
Crystal, you look like you were trying to raise your hand or something. Did I did I did I see that wrong? Mr. Allison? No, no. I was agreeing with everything she oh. said, basically, because I think that it is about families know now you, you have to be intentional and you can't pretend because they're looking for um educators and I when I say educators that's any and all educators in the district from the custodian to the transportation person they're looking for that authenticity and so they know and as well as the students so I was agreeing with what Lisa was saying all the way so but good to see you good to see you both by the way oh good to be seen and good to see you as well you know I think that it's, it's funny because you shouldn't have to be reminded but we're coming out of a crazy period into a new crazy period a new version of crazy Right. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've lamented with colleagues yesterday, we use the word like moment, but a moment is not supposed to last two years. <laughs> we need new language to describe the last two years. And so we also know that our most vulnerable families are are hit harder across the board. And so so a lot of times districts has misstepped and they have undermined trust. We've got to rebuild the trust that was broken last year and now we're breaking the trust again with bad decision making this year. And so those of us that are in systems that have platforms that call shots on any level, we, of course, we all as individuals have to deal with our own stresses. But those of us with more responsibility have to use that responsibility, that platform to also open doors and to facilitate better participation of our families, to facilitate repairing the trust. We got a lot of trust to repair. Uh, and, and so that is also part of the work and hopefully um, through well-oiled community learning centers, there's, there's a better context in which to kind of maintain trust uh, and rebuild trust where it's broken. And that goes to, you know, parent-teacher relationships. All the relationships are spotty right now. So we've got a lot of healing to do as a country. We've got a lot of healing to do, I'm sure, as a state of Ohio, <laughs> right? Whatever city you are in, you got some healing to do at every level, at the micro, macro, meso, all the levels require some attention. I've noticed um, in sort of rolling out some initiatives during COVID that there are definitely some leaders around the state of Ohio that are being super flexible. They're using all kinds of new flexibility and options for families to engage. And then there are, seem to be the flip side. There are some who have hit pause on nearly all their initiatives, um, feel like they're just surviving day to day and not necessarily finding that they have the bandwidth to do, um, to open their doors in new and different ways. So um, to all of you who are the, um, to Kwesi, Lisa, or Stuart, um, what advice would you give those school and district leaders who feel like they're they kind of are too busy or um, a little bit nervous about trying these new strategies that we're seeing? So, do you think the community learning center model would would be a good fit for right now? Why or why not? Yes, Lisa. Quasi, do you want to go? Well, no, no, you go first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll chime in after. So what I would say is I love um, Dr. Mapp's um, description of conditions. And so for me, even the schools that are not necessarily implementing the National Network of Partnership Schools, let it be known that we are a partnership district by saying it, by, again, building that value. Sorry, buses are driving by since I'm talking. It's... Um, it's essential to go back to those to the basics, right? Building relationships one step at a time, um, supporting people. All of us are in this work. Your staff is in this work, they're heavy. Um, teachers are in this work, they're heavy. So I think a, a little bit of grace extended to everyone goes a long way. And so I think this expectation that we don't need to acknowledge the small things um, will shoot us in the foot. Acknowledge the small things. Um, 
um, create an environment of gratitude. And so I would just think it is, it is about the little things. Um, and even so much, and I know, um, uh, Stuart, you may have some, something to add in too. When we've been talking about incentivizing students, what I've been saying is as incentivize families, right? Because they're the ones that are waking kids up, getting them in front of computers, getting them on the bus. Um, and how many of us wouldn't appreciate a raffle basket with coffee and, and a calendar that's specifically going to help me organize? So it's the little things that um, you can do wherever you are, at whatever level you are, that will inspire and go a long way for us to keep taking those next steps forward. I, I would just quickly say that a, a couple of things. It's never a bad time to partner and collaborate. It takes a little bit of extra energy, but the dividends is the reason why we expend that energy on the front end is so we can have the dividends on the back end. What, as we monitored schools and districts all across the country beginning in March of 2020, one of the things that was confirmed through every phase of the pandemic was that districts and communities that already had relationships with families and already had a culture of partnership and collaboration were in a better position to respond to every phase of the pandemic. Everybody was overwhelmed but some folks had an edge because they didn't have to figure out how to work together. They didn't have, they were already in relationship with families, so they didn't have to find them. So they had an advantage through every phase. Uh, and so that's a lesson that we can't lose. At the same time, we also have seen, and I'll just say this frankly, dramatic failures of leadership. <laughs> just, and bad choices on the part of leaders. I'll give you a current example. Uh, somebody I work with closely who, you know, has kids in the school system, uh, they got a message two days, I think I mentioned earlier, they got a message two days before the start of school that there weren't going to be school buses. So they knew they didn't have enough school buses back in July. <laughs> they knew they didn't have enough school bus drivers. I'll put it that way, right? So all over the country, people are trying to find school bus drivers. So this isn't, a, you know, so this isn't like shocking news. And you knew about it a while ago. So it's a leadership failure to choose not to inform your families in enough time for them to respond, right? And it's an equity failure because the most vulnerable families have the least amount of flexibility and the least, so they need more time to know. So they can make arrangements, right? So two days is not enough time for anybody, but it's certainly not enough time for our most vulnerable families. So that's a leadership fit. Stuart, why don't you come in? Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I want to just continue to build off of this even further. Um, I remember um, early on in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic that I was on, you know, a Zoom call and somebody said, you know, Everyone's talking about this um, as a once in a lifetime experience, but in reality, it's a first in a lifetime experience. The world that we live in today is full of uncertainty, it's full of crisis, and that crisis is always going to have uneven impacts and affect historically marginalized communities the most, which you know many of us you know work in schools that, that serve those communities and are of those communities, right? And so if we want to build resilient and effective connected schools, we have to embrace this type of family engagement. We have to embrace the community learning center model. Uh, there, there's research that's been done about natural disasters. This is a slight, slight pivot um, about, you know, what is the number one predictive factor of survival after serious natural disasters? You know, we're talking about like hurricanes, tornadoes, and it is, not wealth it's not how close you were to the you know impact it is literally how well you know your neighbors the level of social connectivity right and so we we need each other this is a fundamental fact of human existence we are vulnerable beings we you know our young take at least 12 years 13 years before they could even hope to survive on their own right this is this is in our nature social beings and if we don't embrace this, 
in our schools and we don't build structures that view every single person as an asset, you know, Meredith in the chat here, right, build that social capital connectedness and resilience, um, then it's the next crisis is going to be the one that knocks us flat. So to anyone that's saying, you know, not now, there are too many urgent concerns, you know, we need to keep it close, you know, trust that small circle, we can't really reach out, we don't want to have these families, they're already mad at us, right? My question is when? When is the better time? Because this is the only way that we're going to be able to meet the moments that life has in store for us. Thank you, Stuart. That, what a great way to close our session. What a powerful message that everyone can walk away with. Um, just again, thank you so much to all three of our presenters for bringing their unique perspectives, national, more of a, a state organization level, and then a district leader of family engagement. Um, let's give them a little bit more Zoom love in the chat. And now is when I plead with you to please complete our end of year, our end of summit survey. This is the last session, so this is the time to do it. Um, I will read and analyze everything you say and make this event bigger and better for next year because I'm the internal evaluation person for our team. So I'm the person that's going to have the first pass at it and then we'll share it with our whole team. And we, I promise you um, we will come back bigger and better next time around. So please take a couple minutes to fill out the survey and thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'm going to stick around for another couple minutes to make sure everyone's in good shape with that survey. Um, but again, thank you so much for coming. Have a wonderful evening. We hope to see you again soon at one of our Ohio Statewide Family Engagement Center events. And um, yeah, thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> Woo!